Hi, everyone. We're just a little bit before uh, the hour, so we're just going to give some time for people to arrive and we'll get going just a few minutes after two o'clock my time, um, whatever the top of the hour is, wherever you are dialing in from today. So I'm so glad uh, to welcome you. And I know some more people are likely gonna filter in and that's okay. Um, and uh, we were going to get going though, just so that we can um, respect the time of our uh, speakers today, but also make sure that there's enough time to get as much conversation in and what I know is going to be uh, lively and fruitful and hopefully loads of information. So hello everyone, my name is Tama Smith. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Professional Development at 18 Doors. I'm so excited to be joined today by my colleague, 18 Doors Chicago Director Tani Prowl, as we welcome three Jewish leaders for a roundtable conversation about what people who work with interfaith families need to know about anti-Black racism. Before we get going, a few housekeeping details. If you require any technical support during the panel, please message Lexi, our administrative program manager. You can find her in the chat as Lexi18Doors. We will be taking questions in the latter part of the round table. Um, if you do have questions for the speakers, um, whether it's one speaker or us as a group, please submit them using the Q&A box. I'm gonna try to get to as many of them as possible um, and hopefully we can get all of your questions answered today. If you require closed captioning of this conversation, um, it is just the live transcript that Zoom uh, provides, uh, but you can access that by clicking the live transcript CC button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, we're recording today's session to share with people who were unable to join us today. So um, none of you as attendees are on camera, but just to let you know. So today, Tani and I are joined by Becky Berger, Caroline Sickner, and Evan Trailer. Um, we will introduce them more fully, and they're here to share their insights grounded in personal experience and expertise. I was so thrilled when all three of them accepted Tani and my invitation. I'm joining you today from my home in Toronto, Canada, where we're currently marking Indigenous History Month. Recognizing the Indigenous communities whose land we are on feels especially vital right now uh, with the recent discovery here in Canada in Kamloops, British Columbia of an unmarked grave of 215 uh, Indigenous children found on the site of a former residential school. A potent reminder for us that racism has shaped the societies we live in in almost unimaginable ways. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land I'm on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And Toronto continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Métis people, and Inuit. Toronto is ceded land covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto sits in the Dish with One Spoon territories, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The Dish represents what is now Southern Ontario, from the Great Lakes to Quebec, from Lake Simcoe into the United States. We all eat out of this dish, all of us that share this territory, with only one spoon. What that means is that we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, I would like to invite you all to learn more about the Indigenous peoples whose land you are on. You can do so at the website Whose Land, and we are putting the link to that in the chat for you. And now turning to the topic at hand. I want to pause and reflect briefly on the fact that pulling together a conversation like this is even possible. When I was growing up, my brother and I were the only mixed race Jewish kids we knew. We were the only Jews of color we knew. In fact, I think it was only in my mid twenties that I met another black Jew when I was living in Israel and first met some Ethiopian Jews. It says a lot about the ways that our community is often lacking in diversity that I can actually still tell you where I was when I first met another Jew like me, the child of a white Ashkenazi Jew and a black parent from a different background at a conference in New York City in 2009 when I was already in my late 20s. 
We know though that our community is diversifying and rapidly. Some of that diversification has been brought about by visibility. My family was actually never the only family like ours. It just felt that way because we didn't see ourselves reflected and represented in Jewish spaces. Some of the diversification has also been brought about by broader demographic shifts, with the recent Pew study showing us that younger Jews are more likely to be people of color than previous generations. 29% of Jewish adults in the United States under the age of 30 report having at least one person in their household who is either non-white or multiracial. The same Pew study also reminds us that interfaith families are racially diverse. A full 8% of Jews in interfaith couples, 16% if you look at the category Jews by no religion, which is a loaded category in and of itself, indicate that their spouse is of a different race or ethnicity. Talking about race and racism then is a Jewish issue, and one that is especially important when we talk about our work with interfaith families. A brief caveat here, not all Jews of color are from interfaith families. However, Many are, and so that is, you know, the intersection of the work uh, of 18 Doors working with interfaith families and this conversation today. Many of you have been with us for a learning opportunity before, but for those who are new to 18 Doors, welcome. 18 Doors is a Jewish organization working across North America to empower people in interfaith relationships, the individuals in those relationships, the couples, the families and their children, to engage in Jewish life and make Jewish choices and encourage Jewish communities to welcome them. Our vision is that people in interfaith relationships are welcomed and embraced by Jewish communities, and my personal far favorite part of our mission, um, are able to contribute to Judaism's enduring strength and continuity. We are so glad to have you here with us today in service of this goal. This conversation today was a year in the making. I first thought up the idea in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the subsequent po protests last June. We knew at 18 Doors that we wanted to respond in some way, but we wanted to respond in a way that was meaningful to our primary audiences, interfaith families and the people who work with them. When Tani joined our team over the winter, the idea for this roundtable was born. I'm so grateful for the, her thought partnership here. As we get underway, I'd like to take just one quick moment to formally introduce myself before I turn it over to Tani, who will introduce herself and the other speakers. My work as the Director of Professional Development at 18 Doors, supporting Jewish organizations and the people who lead them in up-leveling their work with interfaith families is close to my heart. As I already mentioned, I grew up in Toronto uh, through the 80s and 90s in an interfaith interracial household. And it was really only as an adult that I was able to find Jewish spaces that were welcoming of me in the fullness of my identity. My passion as a Jewish professional, first working in Holocaust education and then spending almost eight years as a synagogue membership director, has been working to ensure that people like me are able to find places for themselves in our Jewish community and participate fully in the richness of Jewish tradition. I'm grateful to each and every one of you who works in your communities to support people like me. I'd like to introduce you now to my colleague and partner in pulling together this important conversation, Tani Prell, who will introduce herself and the speakers. Thank you so much, Tema. I am so excited to be with this wonderful, incredible group of people who you all are just such amazing leaders in uplifting the diversity of the Jewish community. So thank you all for being here today. And thank you to uh, everyone who's tuning in to our webinar and who watch this later. Uh, it's such an important conversation. Um, and so first I'm Tani Prowl, she, her, hers, and I am the Chicago director of 18 Doors. And I'm, I'm living in Chicago on the lands of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. And uh, my work here in Chicago is, it, it's such a gift. I, I love working for 18 Doors where inclusion is, is everything that we do. And it's wonderful to be able to take the, the work of our org as a, as a national organization and uh, really be able to think about what that means for our wonderful couples here in Chicago. And so I am very honored that I get to formally introduce our incredible speakers that we have with us today. So with us, we have Becky Berger. Uh, Becky Berger 
is currently the program director for GUF's research training internship, which is a Jewish feminist research cohort for female and non-binary teens. She believes engaging people of all ages in political education and activism is critical to a shared liberatory future, and she's proud to celebrate her Judaism through a deep commitment to social justice. And in her free time, Becky is a co-facilitator of SEDEC Labs Political Educators Cabal, a founding member of Cole Orr, Jews of Color Caucus of the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, and an avid board game player. And then we have Caroline Spickner. Caroline Spickner, she, her, uh, grew up in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and Salt Lake City, Utah. She is the daughter of a Black and Christian father and an Ashkenazi Jewish mom. She graduated from Northwestern University in 2018, where she studied film and dance, and then spent a year living in Beersheba, Israel, as a Masa Israel teaching fellow. Caroline is currently the Springboard Innovation Fellow for Metro Chicago Hillel, so her time is split between planning social justice programs, talking about Torah, and running around Chicago buying students coffee. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, and then we have Evan Trailer. Evan is a rabbinical student at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, where, is he, where he is a Wexner Graduate Fellow and a Kowak Fellow. Originally from Oklahoma City, he graduated from the University of Kansas studying political science, Jewish studies, and leadership studies. And prior to rabbinical school, Evan worked at the Union for Reform Judaism for four years, creating new projects and initiatives in college and young adult engagement. He currently serves on the leadership team for a Jewish Social Justice Roundtable and the Commission on Social Action for the Religious Action Center. Evan is a proud alum of the University of Kansas Hillel, URJ Kutz Camp, Green Family Camp, and served as North American president of NIFTY. And Evan currently lives in Washington, DC. So huge welcome to all of you and, and so glad to be in this conversation today. And there's so many reasons why I'm, I'm really grateful to be having this conversation. Uh, and why I think this this conversation is so important. So first, I'll just share for me personally, and then the implications a, a bit more broadly, uh, and then we'll open it up to the to the group. Um, so I converted to Judaism, and for nearly a decade before my conversion, I had been studying Judaism really deeply, and you know it was my spirituality and the framework that I through which I, I lived my life, and uh, my Judaism had been very individual for me. And so I, I wasn't sure exactly what it'd be like to be part of the, the full Jewish community and the full Jewish people as a whole. Um, and so as a, a mixed race Black woman in America, you know, I, I feel race everywhere. <laughs> it's it's everywhere all the time. And, you know, there's no turning it off. But Judaism for me always felt like there was, it was this calm in the chaos of all of that. Uh, and so in my mind and in my heart, Judaism and Shabbat and my time reading Torah or celebrating holidays, it was a time where I could just, you know, be me without needing to, to fully consider my Blackness. Um, and I continue to, to feel that way a lot through my conversion process. And I'm super grateful that I had such incredibly positive experiences in you know, my bubble of my chosen congregation. Um, and then it was, it was really once I became a Jewish professional that that bubble burst a, a bit for me. And so you know, from microaggressions to questioning of my, my Jewishness or assumptions that I wasn't supposed to be in the spaces that I, I was, um, it, it became, uh, it, was so, it was so disappointing. And um, outside of, of my experiences as an, as an individual, I very, I, I noticed that there was this kind of disconnect between this love of the idea of inclusion versus the lived experiences that people were having. And as Tema was speaking to, you know, our, our Jewish community, the reality of right now is that we are racially diverse and we're going to continue to become even more racially uh, diverse as well. And, and highly recommend Alana Kaufman's Eli talk uh, where, where we recognize that 70% of non-Orthodox Jews are marrying people of a different background background and that background is increasingly racially uh, racially diverse. And so for our Jewish institutions, if there aren't Jews of color there right now, there are there is going to be. And so the more that we can do to not just be tolerant, but to be celebratory and uplift uh, those identities and, and really 
and really create spaces of belonging is going to be huge. And, and I'm so grateful that I get to do that as part of my work uh, at 18 Doors. And so now I want to pass it off to our to our wonderful speakers uh, and invite you to introduce yourselves, you know, share a little bit about your path to leadership and what it means to you to lead the, the Jewish community with the fullness of your identity and what it means for you to be in this conversation today. And uh, Caroline, if you'd like to start it off. Yeah, thank you, Tani. Um, I'm Caroline. I use she, her, hers. Um, I just finished um, my two years as a springboard fellow for Hillel, and I'm continuing to work at Hillel at DePaul University. Um, I, like Tani said in my bio, grew up in Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is a very, very small, highly segregated town um, on the border of Michigan and Indiana. Um, a town so segregated that 90% of Benton Harbor is African American, and the city right next to it is 90% white. And so I lived on the border, um, but felt a lot of um, necessity to switch, do a lot of code switching, depending on like, if I went to school, which was in Benton Harbor, but if I went to the beach, which was in St. Joe, um, I was like very often surrounded by very different populations. Um, and my synagogue was actually in Benton Harbor in the more African American community, although very white. And so I feel like a lot in a lot of ways, similar to Tani, I never felt like my Jewish community was the was the space that I felt a lot of racism. I felt that in a lot of other places um, growing up, but my Jewish community really felt like a part of my mixed identity. Um, we had a lot of interfaith families, although not a lot of interracial families, um, but that just felt like a community that really supported me, even though me and my brother were for sure the only Jews of color that I knew um, until college. Um, but even though I felt like my community really supported me, I never considered going into being a Jewish professional. And I really think that that's because I never saw anyone who looked like me working as a Jewish professional whether that was at my synagogue, whether that was youth group, whether that was summer camp. I just, I felt like I was welcome. And I also didn't see anyone who looked like me in those roles. Um, but going on Masa, actually going to Israel, similar to what Tema said, meeting other Jews of color, mostly who were Ethiopian, um, really helped me recognize, I think, that there were Jews of color and that my perception of the Jewish community as white was a problem um, and something that was really helping me struggle with understanding where I fit into that bubble and into the Jewish community. Um, so I really feel like I went into working for Hillel because I felt the need to see more Jews of color as I was growing up. And I really wanted to make sure that other students see that. And even though most of my students aren't people of color, I think it makes it a lot easier for those Jews of color to come into the space. Um, and I'm just the biggest advocate for Jewish organizations to try to put as many Jews of color in those positions so that younger people really want to step up and take those roles after them. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Becky? Hey, all. Becky Berger. Um, oh, there's so many things to say when you think about how do we talk about this work, right? Um, and what does it mean to be Black and Jewish? And, you know, really resonates with me, what, what Thomas said, what Caroline echoed, but I'm sure Evan will echo is like the, the not seeing anyone like you um, and, and what that means to your understanding of your space in the community. Um, so I often share, I grew up your like most stereotypical Jewish kid that you could possibly imagine. I say that I was like a gold star reform kid. I like, I was a nifty kid. I went to I went to us Rui. I was a Sunday school aide. Um, I did programs at the federation that I work at now. Um, and then I went to I went to college out in Boston, a very Jewish area, and I fell out of Jewish life completely because there was no one that looked like me, um, and I had no tools to navigate what that meant and how to be Jewish on my own as a Black Jew. And so I fell out of Jewish life for almost a decade despite like it being so close to my heart and, and never falling out of touch in a spiritual way, I fell out of communal life for about a decade in part because there just wasn't anyone um, that looked like me. And there to me was a pretty clear, how I always describe it is like, I didn't know what happened, but I knew that Jewish adults didn't look like me 
And so I was pretty clear that there wasn't going to be space for me. In the I didn't really know how it happened, but I knew that there wasn't. Space for me. Um, and then I came back to work as a Jewish communal professional um, in teen programming. And I think really similar to what Caroline was sharing in part to sort of normalize the idea that like Jews of color and, and black Jews in particular are not sort of unicorns, um, but that we have sus been systemically left out of spaces and systemically pushed out of spaces. And the fact that we don't see Jews of color is not because they don't exist, um, but because we're, we often can't find Jewish spaces that are safe for us. Um, and the last piece I'll say is that, Tani, I don't know if you remember this, but when Tani and I met, um, it was just after I had started this job um, and I was at a Jewish educators event and he was working as a synagogue ed educator at that point. Um, and we were in a sea of white educators in Chicago and we locked eyes and we're like, are, are you here for this event? Am I here for this event? And immediately just like, we were like, hi, it's so nice to meet you. We're gonna be best friends. Um, and Tani and I have been very close ever since, right? But it was like, even though we both at that point in our lives had done Jewish, like Jews of color professional development circles and knew that Jews of color existed, we were still even having that community so starved for relationship and connection working within the community that like, even though we had our own separate community, seeing each other just felt like this like drink of water in the desert. Um, and so I'm forever thankful for that too, Tani, just getting getting to meet you and call you my bud forever. Um, but really excited to, to think about how we make spaces better and more thoughtful going forward. I just have to jump in really quickly before we turn to Evan and say, can you imagine on our team of, I don't remember how many people at 18 Doors, when they sent out Tani's bio and I clicked through to see the picture of her and I was like, <gasps> because it is like unheard of in Jewish communal spaces to have two mixed race Jews on the staff. Like that is wild. So I just, you know, want to really drive that home to people is like, we don't see each other easily in, in these spaces. So just, you know, this is going to come up again and again, but I just felt like this was, you know, dovetailing on Becky's story of meeting Tani. It just felt like I had to share that as well. My goodness, and the gratitude is so echoed for these for those moments of of meeting you, Becky, and then Tama, knowing that you were on staff, and just like the the exhale and the and that moment of just absolutely wonderful connection, and and just so grateful, and it's so incredibly important to be in in that relationship. So just so glad, uh, and thanks for sharing, Becky. Evan, now to you. Now to me, um, I've been like snapping and nodding along with everything like this is um, this is good. This is really good. Um, so hi, everyone. Again, my name is Evan. You see him his pronouns. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think as I as I was listening, trying to go back a little bit um, and think about some of my first experiences with Jewish life and how did that translate into leadership. And um, I'm originally from Oklahoma City and grew up in a pretty small Jewish community. There's about 250 or so um, families at my reform synagogue. There was an even smaller synagogue, uh, conservative synagogue in town. And that was pretty, that like that was my Jewish community um, up until high school. And um, looking back at that time, I think there were a couple of things that I think kept me in, in Jewish life and kind of eventually became uh, the springboard. One was that, uh, one was my mom. Um, who uh, is originally from Wilmington, Delaware, and she grew up very connected to her synagogue, was a song leader, um, organized stuff through NIFTY, the reform youth movement when she was in high school. And she was just very adamant that like Jewish life is for myself and for my younger brother, for our family, um, and just like very clear about that. Um, and so we were always a part of what was happening at the synagogue and starting to go to youth group stuff and showing up to services and volunteering. Um, so she is definitely one of the, the kind of like first inspirations for me. Um, the second, and looking back on it, it's so interesting, again, coming from a smaller Jewish community, as I looked out at my uh, uh, religious school class of like 12 students, um, there was one other Jew of color who was there. And so, uh, you know, two out of 12, that's not a lot, but I'm like, I never felt like I was the only one. And there were a few other 
um, multiracial families who are part of our congregation. And so being able to see that, um, I think was really important. Um, it didn't keep me from asking questions, um, especially elementary and middle school, went to really um, racially diverse elementary and middle schools. And then to go to my synagogue and see that it's still 90%, 95% white. Um, it didn't keep me from asking questions, but um, for so many experiences growing up when I was uh, in Nifty and through college in Hillel, I was, I, there were very few times that I was the only one, even if it just meant that there was one other um, Jew of color there. So I think that was really, that was really important for me, but I, I go back to kind of my mom's insistence on like Jew, Judaism and Jewish community is, is for you and don't let anybody else take that from you. Um, and so for me, that meant in high school, starting to get involved with Nifty, went on to serve as the Nifty North American president, where that was the first time once I stepped out of my uh, local community in Oklahoma City um, and other people, other communities, other lay leaders um, got to see me. Um, that was the first time that it really opened up of like, Oh, okay. Up on up on these stages, I am one of few Jew, Jews of color, um, and that's going to be something that people notice. Um, maybe even before I get to do anything in terms of leadership. Um, and again, it just kind of I think reinforced um, my desire to keep to keep working to change that. So through Nifty, through Hillel, eventually during my time. Um, on staff at the Union for Reform Judaism. I have to give a quick shout out to April Baskin, who was a vice president for Audacious Hospitality at the Union for Reform Judaism when I was there. So again, another, another Jew of color um, really opening doors and making sure that, um, that I felt safe and taken care of. And um, as I think about, uh, I just finished my first year of rabbinical school. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, I chose this path is because there need to be more Jews of color who are rabbis. Um, it just has to be. Otherwise, we are missing so much wisdom, um, so much uh, opportunity to learn, so so much, yes, just all those different pieces of our community. And so, um, yeah, I'm really excited about that path um, and have been connecting, which has been fantastic, connecting with other um, clergy students who are Jews of color and um, there, it's, it's a bright future and we have a lot of work to do. So excited to be on uh, with you all today. I am just so consistently inspired and um, blown away by how rapidly the shift is happening um, with the sort of visibility and leadership of Jews of color. Um, you know, when I got into this, it was few and far between. I, took on my first Jewish professional job in 2009, and I was in Jewish studies as a grad student for the three years prior to that, so since 2006. And just watching really in the last five to six years, just this rapid acceleration has just been like so profound. And I'm just, you know, I, I just sit here in gratitude so often when I'm able to convene conversations like this. Um, but let's get into sort of the meaty stuff, right? We're here to talk um, about the hard parts, um, the racism parts, um, and, and the things that people need to know about some of the specific needs of uh, Jews of color and specifically of Black Jews, um, many of whom are from interfaith families. So we are going to talk a lot about the racism piece and try and weave in where, where it is relevant, the pieces about interfaith families as well. Um, but I just want to kick us off and we're going to, you know, this is going to be somewhat of like, there are some questions that we have, uh, Tani and I have prepared, but also like, since Tani and I also share this experience, we're also going to be sort of speakers as well. It's kind of an experiment in a roundtable format. Um, and we'll see how this goes. Um, but the first thing that I think is really important for us to talk about a little bit um, is that in conversations about race and racism in the Jewish community, people are so often lumped together and we've sort of ourselves oscillated a bit between uh, the two things in one large category called Jews of color um, and other times in sort of more nuanced categories here. Why do you think it's important uh, to acknowledge different identities and experiences within this category? Um, and it was Becky who first sort of put this on our radar. So if Becky doesn't mind starting with that one. Yeah, um, 
I've been thinking a lot. Uh, so when when I use the term Jew of color, more and more I am starting, I have envisioned or understood it as a political identity, that it is not just being a person of color that's Jewish, but it is, it is, um, it, it denotes certain desire to see a different Jewish future that is more racially diverse. Um, but I have also been thinking about the way that that designation is often used to be like white Ashkenazi Jews are one category and they're a big important category and they're all this space. And then like, there is this other, there's this other thing that is like Jews of color. Um, that is everything from like, American Jews who are not white within a, a, a racial context to white presenting Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews to Jews who have never stepped foot in the United States um, and are all over the country, right? And we sort of use this designation to be like, well, there is like Jews and then there are Jews of color and that is anyone who is not white in Ashkenazi, right? And even in me describing all of the different things that could possibly fall under that designation, you can hear why that's problematic, right? Because my lived experience as a black Jew from Chicago who has been Jewish since birth is different from someone from a black Jew who converted, is different from um, an Asian Jew in Atlanta, is different from um, someone, an, a Jew who is Indian and living in India, right? All of those are really different experiences. Um, and, and one of the things I'm feeling in this moment and our desire to do better around racial equity as a community, we are like collapsing the like breadth and beauty of, of like what our community has to offer. Um, and I really think that it's important for folks to think not just about this like trend that I think is really beautiful. I said in my bio, I created a JOC space, like not just creating separate spaces because affinity spaces are incredibly important, but also not thinking about sort of like this separate other group, but how do we actually like change the fabric and the foundation of our spaces so that they are more generally welcoming, that they are less Ashkenazi, they are less white, um, and I will add in, they are less hetero, they are less cis, right? There are lots of things we could think about in those intersections. Um, but like, how do we start to understand wanting a diverse community that really has multiple, like rich multiple pieces, not just as like an other, but as like actually interwoven in our community and, and central and foundational. Um, so that's, that is where, where my head is, um, and why I, I, a thing I hope other community builders are thinking about in this moment. Yeah, I, I, I want to plus one everything you said. Um, you know, I think about it so often um, in the spaces that we're building. Um, the tensions between creating spaces that are, um, you know, for people to discuss our experiences and be seen and recognized and heard and felt um, sort of through these through these lenses. Also, these catch-all terminologies that we're using to essentially to distinguish between like majority and minority in so many ways. And you know, another one that I just want to sort of complicate as well is so often I hear Ashkenazi used as a stand-in for white. And like Ashkenormativity is a thing, right? We are a majority Ashkenazi Jewish community here in North America, you know, and that plays itself out in all sorts of ways, whether it's that, you know, we talk about brisket and bagels and cream cheese as Jewish food, like it's all sorts of things, but also so many Jews. And when we get into talking, especially about interfaith families, mixed race families, so many of these Jews of color in interfaith families are Ashkenazi. Um, I'm Ashkenazi. My mother, when she did her, like, my mother did the 23 and me or whatever it was and came up as like a hundred percent Ashkenazi and I saw Evan and Caroline both like put up their hands and that's like very real um 
and like very much part of our cultural identities as well as the cultural identities of being um, black and also being black is all sorts of things. My dad's family is Caribbean, um, which is a very different experience. My father was born in the United States, so he has like much more of a black American experience, but even that depends on where in the United States you're from. So there's so much that we try and lump together under these categories um, that feel like catch-alls in many ways, but also feel like they perpetuate some of the kinds of, um, I'm not going to call it racism, but like microaggressions um, that we experience in, in spaces is collapsing us into identity categories, um, which of course are important um, for people to recognize us as who we are, um, but also are not all that we are. Um, basically, anyone who wants to like weigh in, just unmute yourself and jump in. And if it gets unwieldy, then I will um, sort of moderate a little bit here. Um, I feel like for me, a lot of like the excitement that Becky and Tani were saying about like seeing each other in the same room, it comes down to like having shared experience. Um, and that shared experience depends on your background and your identity and also your age and your gender and all of these different things. And so for me, like, I'm excited anytime I see, I see any other Jew of color in the room. That's just a fact. But also, as a springboard fellow, I like walked into my first day of my cohort and there were 50 of us and there were three Jews of color, all of whom were mixed with black. Um, and that made it really, really helpful for us to have really deep conversations about the intersections of a lot of things that are happening that we maybe wouldn't have been able to have that same conversation if there were Jews of color with further apart identities. Um, and so like, I feel a need for both. I know like working at Hillel, we have a Jews of color group that we bring together every once in a while. And in order for that to be at least 10 people in all colleges in Chicago combined, that's anyone who is any little bit anything of color. Um, but I also know that that doesn't mean they're gonna have, be able to have all of the conversations they wanna have because a lot of them are coming in with different experiences. And so in some ways it's really helpful and in other ways, it's just not gonna support everything that they need. Um, so I feel like there's a space for both. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I wanna, I guess, just pick up on the complexity of like the language piece. And it, feel like, it, it feels like not just in the Jewish community, but like, you know, is it, POC, is it BIPOC, is it, right, like, there's, like, some, um, this language is imprecise, and so the biggest thing for me, I think, it, it, I'll probably talk about this again, feels like um, being in relationship with people and understanding, like, how people want to interact in, in a particular way, um, and so, yeah, if people ask me my background, I'm not going to say, like, I, my default is not, I'm a Jew of color, um, because that doesn't really tell you about me or my life experiences or my history or anything like that. Um, so I think that's like a, um, a piece that, that I'm thinking about um, with all of this. Yeah, um, Evan, you said a word that I think of often that's just like so key, which is that relationship word, right? It's, you know, one of the things that I get asked all the time in this role, and when I talk also about race is like, what do Jews of color need? What do Black Jews need? What do, and, you know, and, and like this assumption that, first of all, there was like a monolithic set of needs. And of course, there's some structural needs. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely get into talking about some of those about just making the community sustain us in, in sort of more meaningful ways. But the idea, and especially when we talk about interfaith families, um, uh, what interfaith families and what interfaith interracial families need depends on the community, depends on um, the makeup of the family, how their, how their religious identity is structured, how their racial identity appears, um, and everything uh, like that, that I think is very important for us to keep in mind that actually when you get to know people, and when you spend time intentionally getting to know people within your community, when you intentionally diversify the group of people that you know, you learn things. Um, that's not an invitation, by the way, to go out and ask the person of color that you know to tell you their life story. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that, I promise. Um, but um, but I think you know being able to be in conversation with people in those ways, I think is really important. 
Um, just a reminder, if you have a question, I know I saw one uh, appear in the chat. Um, I'm not always watching the chat, so please put it into the Q&A box. Um, and please, if you have questions, please throw them into Q&A. We will either address them already um, or get to them in question and answer. I'm going to say a thing because um, I'm seeing it as it sort of relates to the couple of questions that have come in um, and something we had sort of already planned to talk about. So I, I, I saw this question sort of in the chat that's like, I'm a, I'm a membership VP at my congregation. How do I make interfaith families? How do I make um, mixed race or Black people feel comfortable? I saw um, another question that was sort of like, how do we support Black folks who want to be in communal professional roles and not just in our community. Um, and one thing we had already sort of planned to talk about that for me feels really important when I talk about this sort of stuff um, is like the having of difficult conversations and importantly, the having of difficult conversations with not just staff, but with everyone in your community. Um, and so whenever I'm talking about these things and how I've lasted, sometimes I feel how I've lasted as long as I have as a Jewish communal professional, is that my boss at Federation, Hallie Shapiro DeVere, if you know her, she's an incredible educator. She always believes me when I tell her that something racist happens. She never questions it. And she always does what she needs to do. She always has the tough conversation and it doesn't matter who she has to have that tough conversation with. She has had that tough conversation with people. I know it was uncomfortable for her to have that conversation with. She's had it with lay leaders, she's had it with staff. But when I say, hey, like something happened that was racist, it's never a, are you sure? It's never a, well, it's hard to talk to that person because they're a donor or they're, you know, they're more senior than I am or whatever. It is always a like, I hear you, I'm on it always, right? And so for me, one of the takeaways of, of why the job and the space that I'm in has always felt so safe and so welcoming is because like my experience, even when I am talking to someone who is white, they never question when I see racism and I say that this thing was racist, it's never questioned. And it is always taken seriously. And it is always addressed lovingly, compassionately, um, but I think that a lot of times we're at a crossroad where we're like, man, that's a senior staff person. That's a donor. That's our board chair, right? And and like our shoulders go up and our bodies get tense, right? In that like polyvagal theory. And we're like, man, we're gonna have to have comfort, we're gonna have to have an uncomfortable conversation. And like what I want to remind folks is when we don't have the uncomfortable conversation with the person who said something, we won't get to have that conversation with the black person again because they're not coming right? We are inherently choosing sides when we don't have uncomfortable conversations. And it's a, it's a thing we have to be like open and honest about of like, okay, we're going to have to have uncomfortable conversations with people about racism. Um, and if we don't, we're just not going to be able to have people of color in our community. And if we're not committing ourselves to uncomfortable conversations, we are inherently telling people that they are not welcome here. And that is like a hard fact. It is uncomfortable. It is probably like making a lot of people feel sticky and icky as I often say with my teens, right? Of like, oh, that's bringing up some things in my body. But like, it's, it's the truth, right? That we are like either okay with people doing racist things in our spaces or we're not. And if we're not, we're gonna have to have some uncomfortable conversations. And so one thing that folks can do is really start to prepare themselves and their organizations of like, how do we have uncomfortable conversations? Because they're gonna look different in different spaces, but like we have to be ready to have those conversations if we want people in our spaces. No, Tani, go ahead. <laughs> that, yeah, thank you so much for that, Becky. And just echoing so much what you what you said and uh, also connecting it to one of the other questions of um, about leadership as well and, and how do we empower our Jews of color to be in leadership positions and I I think about the 
how you brought up your supervisor who's like there for you, believes you, supports you, gives these, it, there's not a question, like if you felt it, it is. And um, I think about that in terms of like the retention of Jews of color in, in our, our communal leadership um, spaces and how having, having supervisors and leadership who support who name racism who are able to face it directly and and i and i definitely give kudos to jody our ceo for for doing this as well and naming it when when it needs to be named and uh and to as a as a community member to observe have moments of being able to observe that publicly is is just huge and i think like if i'm sitting in a space and i'm recognizing that the leadership of this org is is a facing things head on and leaning into that discomfort like that speaks volumes um and that it's not just once but it's regular it's ongoing it, it becomes just the way of doing things is is really really vital um and so i think that is what's going to help get additional jews of color in in additional leadership uh positions and that also that representation and that representation piece like people are in these organizations because and for periods of time because they have been have been able to to feel that support which is which is really huge so um thank you for bringing that up becky plus one to all of that <laughs> um you know i i worked in synagogues for a very long time and um one of the things that i was always really keenly aware of as uh, being a membership director um as a staff person you're in a little bit of a funny situation when something happens with a member um and that is complicated uh for all sorts of reasons um and uh, there's a, there's a certain degree of like learning to live with it, which is a horrible thing to have to say. Like, can you imagine, um, well, just imagine how we feel as Jews in spaces that are not Jewish spaces when anti-Semitism comes and nobody addresses it. Um, and, you know, that that's a lot of the time the experience of being um, a mixed race person, a Black person in Jewish space. Um, and one of the things that I just want to flag um, that's more, that's specific, especially to a uh, a context with programming, whether it's uh, people coming in a, as program participants or synagogue members, whatever it might be, is that you can say all the right things um, from the front of the room. But when the person at the back of the room says something racist to the person uh, who is coming to your space, that person may never come back. Um, and so it's a lot of it is about you know, what is tolerated in your space. And this, by the way, goes for interfaith families as well, um, whether they are um, people of color or white, um, you know, what is said to people sort of with marginal identities in Jewish communal spaces, um, of course it goes uh, LGBTQ community, like all of the above, what is said pushes people out, um, pushes people away. Um, and so what does it mean? And I don't have an easy answer here, but what does it mean to bring the entirety of the community along on this journey? Um, it makes me think, Tema, just, uh, I think I was in a conversation just a couple weeks ago, um, very like similar topic and kind of thinking about, okay, how do we want to, how does this organization want to progress um, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion work? Um, and the first thing that I said was that, okay, well, are we looking at um, a, a one-year plan or like a five to 10-year plan? Because the one-year plan isn't going to do anything. Like you're going to feel good, maybe. Um, there might be some cool events, maybe, right? Exactly. Um, there's going to be some events. There's going to be a couple of trainings, like, um, but at the end of the day, like, it's not going to, it's not going to produce the results. When we look at like a five to 10 year plan and like the real commitment that goes beyond that and saying, okay, we're going to contract with somebody. We are going to institute these different policies. We are going to all of these different things. Um, that's where we can actually see some progress. Um, and it, it is just fascinating over the last couple of weeks, you know, uh, seeing the kind of one year since George Floyd was murdered that billions of dollars that companies said that they were going to give to um, Black-led organizations have not been given to Black-led organizations. Um, and in fact, in some polls, we can see that white people are 
even like downsliding in terms of like their support for the Black Lives Matter movement since a year ago, right? And so again, if if the if the plan is only okay, well, we want to try to do X, Y, and Z, and you know the plan is only six months, a year or so. Um, again, you might feel feel good, um, but in terms of actual progress, like there needs to be a a broader commitment. Um, and to that to that point as well. Um, I think the piece that I think gets left out when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion a lot um, is equity. Um, it's the the diversity and inclusion piece of like, okay, like we can be inclusive um, still implies like other people coming into the space with leaders who are currently there. Um, but when we look at equity, like that is really, that's changing who has power in the situation. Um, so I'll, I, I can give one example um, so I'm a member of the leadership team for the Jewish Social Justice Roundtable. Um, and a few years ago, um, there was a leadership team of representatives from different organizations, and there was a racial equity team um, that was there as kind of working in tandem, but was, um, but was still a separate team. And at the end of the day, the leadership team ultimately still had deciding power. Um, and uh, from tremendous leadership from uh, white Jewish leaders in this social justice space, they said, no, like, we don't need two teams, we need one team. Um, and we need to put it into the bylaws that the leadership team needs to be at least a third um, Jews of color or Sephardi Mizrahi Jews. Um, and that was the change, right? And it, it, it's disrupting the who has power um, in the space. Um, and we've talked a lot about representation. Representation is not the end all be all. And if we want to look at equity and we want to flip some of the, the uh, experiences, the strategy, like that, the, some of those pieces have to, to flip as well. That's so huge. And, you know, I, I think a lot, I think I, I upset people often when I say, you know, this isn't, this isn't a one-year plan. This isn't a five-year plan. You're looking at a 10-year plan here, especially when we talk about leadership. Um, and, you know, when we talk about leadership and again, everything I'm saying here also relates to interfaith families who have been pushed, pushed aside, um, whether they are white, white couples or whether they are interracial uh, couples, um, because what we are doing is we're not just sort of inviting people in, but we're actually uh, addressing the ways that they've been pushed away. Um, and that is slow and steady work. And you've got to do that before you can even uh, cultivate people into leadership. Um, and, you know, there are people who are ready to jump in and step up and, and those people generally tend to identify themselves to you if you if you're willing to listen. Um, that I think is the a, a really important piece of this. Um, I'm actually going to switch up the format a little bit because some of the questions that are coming in um, are things that we're like planning to talk about or are talking about. So keep the questions coming and I'm going to work them into the conversation and we're just going to keep discussing amongst ourselves and then we might do a formal Q&A at the end or we might just keep going like this. Um, so <laughs> um, because one thing that did come up a, a handful of times um, in what we're talking about that I, I know we wanted to uh, speak about and this isn't from the questions from the audience, but this is something that I know we wanted to talk about, uh, given the moment in time, uh, which is the rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we we know we're living through a moment uh, where there's been a stark rise in anti-Semitism, and rightly that the Jewish community is very concerned for uh, our safety. Um, and so the question I think that, that comes up often is why is it important to continue to, to prioritize the anti-racism work that we're doing alongside uh, the work that we're doing to address anti-Semitism? And I can't remember who it was who had wanted to talk about that. It might've been Becky again, um, but I'll just open up. Maybe not, I might be totally wrong, um, but I've just, I should have written down who said what in our prep conversation, but I never do that and I learn my lesson every time. Um, but if anyone wants to jump in on that, just unmute yourself and go for it. You just think it's me because I talk too much, Emma. That's what it is. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, look, I also talk too much. So maybe it was me. I don't know. <laughs> I, I posed the question. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Above. It was Tanny. It was me. It was me. I, um, and it's, I, I write up because it's a question I've been hearing uh, often. And I think it's so just. A, as a person of color in America, 
I have an awareness of white supremacism as soon as I was aware that I was a person of color. And so important to recognize anti-Semitism and racism as under this umbrella of white supremacy. And there, you know, there's not a world that exists where Jews are safe in America until it is safe to be a black person in this in this country, which it's not. And uh, and that's systemic. And every system that we can think of, our healthcare, our education, our housing systems have been built to actively oppress Black people in this country. And that is, that is a unique function of, of America and, and the way that race works here. And so we have to, there's so many levels to it. And so we have to be combating it on the, on the systemic level. Uh, in order to be able to dismantle the system as a whole that that creates anti-Semitism and lets it lets it fester and uh, and unfortunately wasn't so surprised that there was an increase in anti-Semitism uh, because there's it's still such a a prevalent part of the way that our that our country functions um, in terms of of our systems of of oppression and so. We have to continue in the work. We have to, and it's hard, and it's it's going to be long work. And like, and to your, and as everyone was saying, like, it's not. There's no easy fix. Like these systems are hundreds of years in the making, and um, that so there's not a way that it can take a year to for it to to change. But we can be in the in the process of of doing so, which many places are, and we can continue to to push it to push it forward. Right. So important. And, you know, just one one additional sort of point that I think is really important to remember is that our communities aren't isolated communities, um, as you are seeing right in front of you now, there is overlap. And so um, what I hear um, when somebody says we don't have time to fight racism, anti-Semitism is on the rise, is that my um, my presence and my safety actually doesn't fully count. It only counts insofar as I'm a Jew. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that that is, when we think about some of the messages, when we think about what comes across, and, and I also think, you know, that, that it's very important to be talking about this um, across our communities. When I think about the messages that come across by sort of saying, we, we'll get to that issue later once we solve this other issue. First of all, that's not how it works. These are all intertwined, um, as Tani so eloquently pointed out. But also it says that actually there are Jews whose safety counts more, um, which is a hard thing to hear. I think also um, with the rise in anti-Semitism, it becomes very, very obvious how good the Jewish community is at organizing. Um, they like bring in everyone and do everything and are so, so able to just make huge moves so quickly and nothing will stop us, um, which I think is amazing. It's just like such an incredible part of the Jewish community. And it also puts into perspective what the priorities really are when it comes to fighting racism in the Jewish community. Um, because I think a year ago, a lot of Jewish organizations were like, oh my gosh, this is big and huge and we have to do a lot. And I think we took some steps, but I think there were a lot more cave caveats um, and a lot of things that kept us from doing all of the things that we really wanted to make happen, um, which makes me feel confident that the Jewish community could do a lot more when it comes to fighting anti-racism because we're doing so much more when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism. going off of that, right? I, I think maybe it's the opposite side of the coin Caroline is talking about, right? It's like how good we are about mobilizing and organizing around anti-Semitism. I think the other side of coin is how little we tolerated in our spaces compared to how much we tolerate racism, right? And we are very clear, importantly, I want to be like explicit, they're very clear importantly that there is not space for anti-Semitism and that like we do not make space for anti-Semitism. Um, but when we are talking about other types of oppression, we are much more comfortable making space for that. 
Um, and so, you know, I have often said, we have to find a healthier balance. We have to get better at showing the same compassion to folks who are learning and trying to support the Jewish community um, and who make missteps. We have to get, we have to be as compassionate as we want people, as we want to be treated when, when we do something that we didn't realize was sexist or, or transphobic or whatever it is, right? And we have to like get the muscles better in both directions, right? We have to get like stronger at what I say is like holding each other lovingly accountable in ways that like continues to hold that lovingness. Um, but also we have to get better at deciding like when we have given people enough chances um, and we have to sort of do what we have gotten very good at to say like, look, we just don't follow this thing. Um, and so I, I, I think that in a lot of ways, the ways in which many Jewish communal organizations think and respond to anti-Semitism is actually a great roadmap. Like our communities have spent decades, centuries building up how we respond to one type of oppression. I think similar to sort of like what Tani was saying, what Caroline is saying is like, now is the moment to sort of think about how do we take those apparatuses that we've built and make them more holistic and say that they apply to every form of oppression in our community and not just anti-Semitism. Ooh, this is so good. Um, wait, okay. I want to try something out and I'm curious, Becky, I'm like, I'm thinking about what you just said and I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm seeing that. And I'm also seeing, um, I've heard a saying that like when, uh, when other groups might be targeted in the United States, you know, there's like a protest, there's a boycott, da, 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 da. Jews, we create organizations like that. And we're just like, boom, great. We're going to take care of it. Um, and I'm like, I'm, I've also seen the ways that that then, especially in relation to other groups can, um, can bring up some like, uh, like, uh, white supremacist like strategies or tactics, right. That kind of like overshadow other groups too. Um, and so I'm like seeing what you're saying of like, we need to, we need to have the same type of fervor for other areas in our own community. And then I'm thinking about, um, in relation to other groups, because then it's the people who are, have the intersections who are hurt the most when they're, when there's that reaction. So I'm thinking about in 2016, the black lives matter movement put out this beautiful, beautiful platform about like how, what would it, what would it really look like for black people to be free in this country, in the United States? Um, and as part of that had some really harsh, tough language around Israel. Um, and there were so many Jewish communities and organizations that were just kind of like, all right, we can't do anything with the black lives matter movement. Now, I don't know how many of them were actually doing stuff in the first place. Like it, it's kind of unclear to me, like didn't really know you were working with them. Um, and like, it, yeah. And the people who like, who were hurt the most were the people at the intersections. So us, right. Like of this kind of like, okay, like I might not like fully agree with this, with this platform or statement or whatever, but like, I like, I want that. Like, I want that kind of freedom that that document is articulating. Um, and like, I, you know, I want to be connected with my Judaism, but like, this ain't the way to do it. Like, this is not what, what, what needs to happen. So I guess I'm also just thinking about what are the ways that we respond to different to anti-Semitism and to other um, like challenging topics in a way that is um, going to, maybe this is what you were saying, but like going to secure like our entire community, not just the people who like might be in charge at, but like really thinking about all the people who have all these different intersections, like let's like secure and like prioritize safety for all of us. Um, while also being mindful of the ways that we're interacting with other, with other communities too. Can I just say, Evan, it's that that is so central, right? And I think it's it's also about those relationships that we're building. So I'm thinking about in Chicago, um, we when what I was um, used to work at a Jewish community organizing organization um, that takes its anti-racism work very seriously. And um, a, a 
Chicago-wide coalition was forming to think about like, how do all of these different organizing organizations across the city come together um, to sort of like fight and feel protected for white nationalism? And they were against white nationalism, let me be clear. Um, and um, we're putting together all these different subgroups and they specifically reached out to us in a Jewish capacity to be on the public safety group because they were like, look, we know that Jews are targeted by white supremacist violence. And like, if we are thinking about public safety, we have to have a Jewish voice, right? And so like, these, this was a broad coalition of almost all POC organizations. And it's because of the work that we did, right? And the like continually building and talking and saying, we're here for you, we've got your back. Not only we're here for you, we've got your back, our community includes people of color, right? Our community includes people of color and we do this work because there are Jews of color. And in turn, what we, what we were given, right? Was the like, we hear you on white supremacy and how it affects Jews. We hear you that anti-Semitism is scary and violent, right? But it was, it was the building of those relationships, right? It was not coming in and being like, anti-Semitism is the most important thing facing us in, in this moment and everyone must like participate in the ways that we are saying, but it was a like understanding of the landscape and the relationships that we built that meant like when the work was happening and people were thinking about how do we keep each other safe, anti-Semitism and white nationalism as it affects Jews was not discluded. It was front and center on everyone's minds because of the work in the and it was hard, but it happened. One thing I'm thinking of, um, you know, these, these alliances and relationships are, are, it's like so, so, so crucial. And one thing that I'm thinking of is just bringing us down uh, to the Jewish community level as well. Um, and thinking again about, um, about um, surprise, surprise, I'm going to say thinking again about interfaith interracial families, <laughs> is that very often, not always, but very often in interfaith interracial families, the person who is a person of color, um, and I know this is the case for a few of us on this call, um, that the Black person in that family is not Jewish. Um, and so when we think about our spaces and when we think about um, showing up uh, against racism and saying racism isn't allowed here, I think we also need to remember and consider it's not just the Jews of color, the children um, or the people who've converted to Judaism, the children of interracial families, the people who've converted, whatever it might be that has brought um, Black people into Jewish community, whether by birth, by conversion, by adoption, whatever else, um, but also the fact that there are people in our spaces um, who are in Jewish households and Jewish families who are not themselves Jewish, who experience um, racism in this world in, in different ways. And so, you know, I'm very mindful often when we're talking about this, um, that we're talking um, about multiple layers of this. We're talking about the experiences, for example, that um, Black Jews have of having their Jewish identity invalidated um, by people in the community because they don't understand how somebody Black could possibly be Jewish, but also, you know, the experiences of, you know, my dad, for example, who things that we take for granted in Jewish space because of the experiences of anti-Black racism to, that he had lived in his life felt like racism. Um, and I'll give a specific example that like when he said it, I was like, oh yeah, this makes so much sense. And also this is a challenging thing for us to think about and address. Um, that you know, the first time he attended a Jewish funeral um, and was told he didn't count to a minion. Um, brought up all of those feelings of not counting as a black person, even though in this space, he could have been a white person who was not Jewish and not count, it was an Orthodox minion. Um, but you know, when we think about the ways in which race shows up in our spaces and the ways in which, um, you know, intent and impact and intent don't necessarily match up, there's just so much complexity to it. Um, and every time I think that I've got a grasp on like what all the issues are and might be, it goes deeper. Another piece that I'll, I'll mention sort of in passing is, um, you know, the experiences within families um, that, that, that can happen um, when 
uh, somebody, uh, uh, sort of a white Ashkenazi Jew brings home a person of color who is not Jewish and not white. Um, and there is, you know, the, for those of us who are working with people in our Jewish communities, we need to be ready to provide support to people who come to us saying, I brought home my boyfriend and my mom flipped out, you know, and um, really not downplaying the fact that there is serious racism inside of our community. Um, and, you know, we could, we could all share experiences, but it's all over the internet, just Google Jews of color sharing their experiences of race and racism. We all, I think all of us have probably talked about it at length. Um, and, you know, some way, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's extremely not. Um, and, you know, those, those are some of the pieces that I really think of often when I think of this conversation. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this one? And then I actually want to make sure that we do get to the questions that are here. Cool. Okay. Wait, so, I was going to say one thing. Oh, yeah. I'll say something about everything. So I'm thinking about my wedding, right? And like, I come from an interfaith family. And I think that like some of the inclusion is not just, oh, I think we often think about like, how do we include people so that it, it doesn't feel racist, but not so how do we include them so that they feel welcome, right? And so like, I think about um, my, my wedding, I had a very, a very like traditional Jewish wedding but I had my black family who was not Jewish and who has never been to a Jewish wedding, right? And so like we intentionally designed our program so that like my grandmother could hold it and understand and read a little bit about each piece that was happening, right? Um, and like we intentionally built in, in mind in a way that was like loving and welcoming and not othering that like, how do we hold how do we hold space and bring people into these spaces and make space for people in our tradition, especially when we know that like halakhically there are times where we just can't, right? When we are thinking about like when maybe we are thinking about who um who makes a minion, when we are thinking about like who can hold the Torah at someone's bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah or bane mitzvah, um, right? That there are like places where given our observance, we might not be able to make the space we want to make, but like, how do we create the community that we want to create that that, that like is joyous and welcoming and isn't just like in the absence of like, we don't want it to feel racist for you, but actually as a non-Jewish person who's participating in this life cycle event, who is participating in the Shabbat service, who is participating in whatever, that like you feel loved and welcome regardless of being Jewish or not, right? And it's not just the absence, but it's it's the addition and the, and the like welcoming in that we have to think about both pieces. And I think that's actually not only for the non-Jewish Black people or people of color who are coming into this space. I think that at least like within our organization, we struggle sometimes with the like, we're doing these race things because we want to make sure that the Jews of color feel welcome. And I think it's easy to forget that like Jews of color aren't going to feel welcome if they feel like half of their family wouldn't feel welcome. Um, so it isn't just for them, it's for the people that they feel like they're a part of that community, because if they only feel like half their community is welcome, then it doesn't matter what you're doing for them specifically. If they have to be Jewish to be welcome, it still doesn't help. Yes, I think all these pieces and another layer that I'll add for folks who are in Jewish organizations, um, also people of color who are not Jewish working at organizations um as well that like um in some cases can feel i don't know like right rightfully so we are we are having a conversation about jews of color um and also that there are there are a lot of people of color who are working in jewish organizations in jewish spaces um are oftentimes like responsible like have a lot of responsibility for helping um communities and organizations run and so also uh, like reflecting on the dynamics of that um, and understanding uh, uh, their their role and um, and taking on this as like absolutely for families and also like if we are creating a community or an organization that is going to be um, strong and vibrant like that also includes um, Jews of color and also people of color who aren't Jewish. 
Yeah, I think that's so huge, Evan. And I think that's one of the big jumps between being an inclusive and place and being an anti-racist institution is that like it's not just being Jewish that's the designator of welcoming and belonging, but it, it's your humanity that you bring into the space. And we're going to recognize your humanity when you come in, regardless of what you of, of your background. Um, and so thank you for uplifting that, Evan. Yeah. Um, wow. That's, you know, I, these are all things that I think about so much. And I also am just learning so much being in conversation with you all today and really just want to keep it going um, forever and ever. And I wish that we had time to do that, but we don't. Um, one thing that I, I just want to sort of raise it as well, that I think, you know, when when people talk to talk about Jews of color and talk about um, experiences that, that we have, and, and I'm sure for um, the, for um, most people who have paid attention to the questions around Jews of color and Jewish spaces, this story will not come as a surprise to you. Um, and I'm just going to share it because I think it's a huge thing when we think about um, in, in, moving beyond inclusive spaces to truly welcoming and embracing community where each person shows up. So um, my brother doesn't know I share this story because he thought nothing of it because he doesn't live his day to day life so embedded in Jewish communal space. Um, but my brother's name is Asher. Um, Hebrew name. My name's Tema. I was named out. It's a Yiddish name after my great aunt. Um, and my brother worked as a manager of a restaurant in a Jewish neighborhood. And regularly, regularly, he would get asked if he was aware that his name was a Hebrew name or that was he aware that his name was a Jewish name. And because he doesn't spend a whole lot of time in Jewish space, he just thought like, haha, that's funny and weird. Like, of course I do. Like, why would why else would my name be Asher? Um, because he wasn't part of that conversation. But I think about, I mean, my brother has been to synagogue for family funerals and I think only family funerals. Um, you know, he's not somebody who, um, who uh, spends time in these spaces to feel the impact of that in the way that somebody who has asked that over and over and over again when they're in a synagogue um, might experience it. Um, and, you know, it, and so just naming that, um, when we think about the invalidation of people's Jewish identities, um, it, it's, is huge. Um, and I think, you know, I just, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the ways in which we question people's Jewish identities in ways that might seem natural to us. Um, and I, I use us broadly, but it might seem natural to be like, hey, I'm going to teach you a cool fact about Judaism. But all that goes into that is the assumptions about who he is and 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 who he isn't. Um, so I just want to name that very quickly. So there are three questions that kind of all fit together. Um, and um, so what I want, I'm going to read them all out and then we can sort of jump on them for the last 10 minutes. Um, so um, we have a question. Um, first, um, I just love this framing. Um, uh, so uh, Rabbi Dr. Chava Bali, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, so she's very grateful to learn with us today um, and that each of us at one point spoke about Jews of color do exist um, and that it makes her keenly aware of how existential these questions can be for Jews of color um, and thanked us for that awareness. Um, the key point of her question here is how can rabbis who are not people of color be better allies? The other two questions we have, uh, Rachel Court asks, is it okay to ask families directly what they need and how do we do that without being tokenizing? And uh, finally, Neve Shalom, which I um, think might be a community name, but might not be, um, is a, it, the person asking is the membership VP at a conservative congregation and wants to know more about what to do to make interfaith um, and uh, interracial, mixed race, um, people of color feel more comfortable in their communities. So really we're getting down to the nitty gritty practical like parting thoughts part of this conversation. Uh, so let's dive in. I'm gonna say something that feels complicated um, and I, Rachel, I, I know you, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of answer your question directly in a way that like probably isn't helpful, but I hope it is helpful. So like when I think about, right, this idea of like, can we ask people what they need directly? I think it is, it is about, well, like what is 
the what is the ways that you ask your community what you what it means in general right and so like if you are not in a habit of asking the community like what do you need from our synagogue to to feel more welcoming in general then it's super alienating to like send an email or or have a staff member call all of the interfaith families all of the joc families right like that's really alienating even when it is it is in good faith and so some of it i think is about like how do you go back to your welcoming practices? How do you go back to your evaluation practices? How do you go back and sort of make sure that they are holistic and that you are capturing everyone? And that's the way it's not tokenizing, right? It's like having a culture of being like, this is a place that we ask these questions regularly of everyone in our community to make sure that they feel loved and whole, right? And also, if you see something happen if you're somewhere like it is also okay to ask that conversation right like if or, or to ask that question if like you notice that you have an interfaith family who like is in your sunday school or in one of your programs and like they stop coming it's okay to call them and ask them like hey like we've been seeing you what like why is that right um you can you can sort of hold the both and of like sometimes it might be super appropriate and not tokenizing at all you have a sense if you saw something happen right like you can hold that and really the way to understand how people feel in your community is about like your practices as a whole and going back to like how do we ask these questions of our community in general not just like I, I think about when I showed up at, at JCUA for the first time and the community that I love and I am deeply a part of, every single person on staff asked me for a one-on-one -on -one and like eight numbers because they were like, there is a black person here and we want them to feel so loved. And I stopped coming for six months because I was like, nope. Like if it is that exciting to you that I am here, I'm like, I'll be back, right? And I like took a step back. Um, and so I, th I think that it's this both and, right? Of like, how do we welcome everyone? And how do we ask pointed questions when we know something is wrong or we know people need something, but we're not sure what it is? Um, I think about this really often uh, as well, um, which is how do you set yourself up to make it clear that you're here to listen to? Um, you know, we can't always uh, see everything that happens. We can't always um, sort of recognize when maybe somebody isn't relating to the programming we're offering because of something to do with the way that they plug into our community. And so how do you set yourself up so that it's clear, um, and you know, in this context, we're talking about race and interfaith families, that people who are, um, you know, people of color, people who are from interfaith families can be like, actually this practice that you have kind of puts me off for some reason. And a lot of that comes from practice and the other thing I'm going to say is we're all going to get it wrong like every I have done things wrong when talking to interfaith families and when talking to uh people of color and I come from both of those worlds like this is real um because not everyone again has the same experiences and so we all step in it uh from time to time so it's being that having that humility to be able to say I am so sorry that this made you feel tokenized. That wasn't my intention at all. I just, you know, noticed that you hadn't come and wanted to check in and make sure that everything was okay. Um, you know, my bad. Um, and really take ownership and not explain it away, not stumble over everything, trying to make it better. Um, which is, by the way, human nature. If somebody tells you that you hurt their feelings in some way or you made them feel excluded we all want to be like that's not what i meant and that's fine just practice the skill of um not having to explain it away we have three minutes left oh my goodness where did the time go um so let's just do a quick little round robin um of uh trying to i think i think we've more or less answered the questions that were there uh for us to answer but let's just go around. Um, so let's go Caroline, Evan, Becky, Tani, and then we will round this out with 
um, what I have in my little concluding script. Anything? Anything. Okay. Um, I feel like all the things that we've talked about, what it comes really down to is that we're talking about like really massive culture shifts um, and that those take a lot of years, which we've talked about in length, but I think also that they take a lot of mistakes before you get them right. Um, and something that I've been seeing a lot in the past years with people trying to shift how they look at race, how they talk about race is getting scared or stopping adding themselves to conversations because they messed up once or feeling like, ah, like if I'm not a part of this community, I can't speak on it. And I think that everyone has to continue trying after making mistakes over and over again in order for us to actually shift this culture in the way that needs to be. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that like, this is the work of, of Judaism in the Jewish community. This isn't an, an add on, um, like diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, where, like it, it, it is at the, at the center. It is the essence of what we're trying to do in building a beloved Jewish community. So, um, I guess I just hope that we can all like take the, the, the seriousness of the task at hand, because it is exactly what we are supposed to be doing. Um, I think I just want to lift up what so many folks said at the beginning that is like, this is a, this is not a six month process. This is not a year process. This is a five year, a 10 year. This is a forever process, right? Of like continually making sure that your space is welcoming to anyone that wants to come in. Um, and that is justice oriented and righteous, right? It's a forever process, not a like checklist. None of us People ask all the time, I'm sure every single person on this call has been asked for a checklist of like, how can, how can I fix it? Uh, and there's no checklist. You just got to keep trying every single day um, and be in that work forever. Loving all of this. I, I want to end with just gratitude to Evan and Becky, Caroline and Tema for being in this, in this conversation and, uh, and, and echoing the, that this is lifetime work and also that the individuals in our communities are real humans, real, real people with their own stories and that we're taking the time to be in that deep relationship and, and in sacred community with one another. And we're going to, we're going to move the, we're going to move the work forward together. And it's going to take time as, and it, and it's okay. I'm plus wanting everything again. Um, you know, it's just so inspiring um i i am pretty sure i'm the oldest person uh in this in this group of speakers and if i could tell 15 year old me or even 25 year old me that this would be possible one day i don't know if i would believe it and um i just you know again want to lift that up because change is happening and it's happening rapidly and it's happening in the ways that are putting people like us in positions to tell people who are 15 and 25, like there are role models in the community and there are people here who are working to build that space um, for you to show up as you. Um, so with that said, I wanna thank, um, thank you all for being part of this um, and thank everyone who came, whether you were able to stay right to the end and I hope you watched the video to catch the part that you missed um, or whether you'll watch this later for joining us um, and thank the audience members who asked questions for insightful questions. I hope everyone viewing this uh, leaves with some new learning and at least one concrete thing you'll be able to take back to your organization to deepen your engagement of interfaith families and in this case interfaith interracial families. This year we're going to be presenting more opportunities to learn from Jewish professionals and clergy from across the field on issues that are topical and critical for our work with interfaith families. I'm so thrilled to announce the next event in this series, which uh, is called What You Need to Know About Racism When Working with Interfaith Families. Our second installment, the date is not yet set, uh, will be a panel on anti-Asian racism, especially responding to the dramatic rise in that over the last little while. Stay tuned uh, for a date. Uh, we will definitely email you with that. It'll be sometime later this year. 
You're all going to receive a link to the follow-up survey, which uh, Lexi just threw in the chat. Um, I hope you'll take a few minutes to complete it. Hearing from you what would be most helpful um, in your roles uh, helps us to design future learning opportunities for you. Last but not least, 18 Doors is thrilled to have launched our first e-learning unit, The Language and Optics of Interfaith Engagement, which is available free of charge on our website. You can access it by visiting 18doors.org slash e-learning. Thank you one last time for joining us today. I hope to see and learn with you again soon.